It is still the day of resurrection. The risen Christ appeared just hours ago to the women. And as Luke tells the story, many of the same emotions present at the empty tomb are still churning. It seems that the seven-mile walk to Emmaus is characterized by fear, disbelief, disappointment, and still a pervasive sense of confusion about what has happened and what is yet to come. Imagine, if you will, that you are Cleopas, walking along on the evening of the resurrection. It's just you and a good friend. It has been a long three days for you. You are one of those who have staked your life on the claim of Jesus, that he is the Son of God. You have followed him closely, but not too closely. You are not among the 12 disciples, but you have been present for many of the big moments in the ministry of Jesus. Perhaps you were at the wedding in Cana, and you were probably there on the hillside when Jesus used the meager lunch of a little boy to feed 5,000 people. And maybe you were there when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, and even when he turned over the tables in the temple. Close, but not too close. And you know that Jesus was crucified. And that's the end of the story, as you understand it. The man who healed and preached, who touched sinners and sick people, who welcomed children and lepers, lepers and gathered all manner of people to himself. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, who you thought to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, is dead. You are distraught. You are defeated. And you and your friend are in deep conversation about the events of the last three days. Your journey to Emmaus is one of seeking and questioning. It is one of longing, and finally, it is one of wondering. Wondering what in the world is going on, and how did you get it so wrong? And so as you walk, you are joined by someone unknown to you. But the man doesn't remain silent. Instead, he begins asking questions about your conversation, and you respond rather sharply to him by asking him if he's the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened in the past three days. And then maybe feeling a bit of remorse for that, you backpedal a little, explaining to the stranger that Jesus of Nazareth was handed over to the authorities, condemned and crucified. You even tell him that some of the women were at the empty tomb that morning and that an angel told them that Jesus was alive. But that's all beyond belief for you. Clearly, you're still trying to figure it all out. More questions, more doubts, more despair. And then the stranger begins to tell his story. He goes all the way back to Moses and to the prophets as his story unfolds. But still, you don't recognize this man, though you do understand the story, and it seems quite similar to the story of Jesus of Nazareth. It is if you can almost call this man by name, but not quite. The village of Emmaus is now within sight, daylight is fading, and you're beginning to wonder more and more about the man walking along beside you. So you and your traveling companion convince the stranger to stay with you. And what happens next seems so familiar. As you sit down to eat dinner together, that stranger takes the bread, 
it's ordinary bread. And he offers thanks to God and breaks it and gives it to you. That's all he does. That's all he does, and all of a sudden, you know. You just know. The scales fall from your eyes, and you recognize him as the risen Christ, the one who took a couple of small loaves of bread and several fish from a little boy. And he did the same thing. He blessed them, broke them, and gave them to 5,000 people. And again, with the disciples on their final night together, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And the eyes of all who saw him were opened. Now, I've never been to Jerusalem. I've never followed in the footsteps of Cleopas and his friend, but I have made the journey to Emmaus more than once. I expect you have too. In fact, I think I've seen you on that journey. You start out alone, distressed, doubtful, that there will be good news along your path. And somehow, along that path, that seven-mile journey, the risen Christ falls into step beside you. Maybe at first, you don't really recognize who he is, and then your eyes are opened, and you recognize him. I have taken the first step and then another, and the stranger, dressed in the garb of a hospital physician, falls in with my journey. And he says yes, yes to life. Yes to life as full as it can be for as long as it continues. Yes, he will not suffer. Yes, he can go home. Yes, we will make him comfortable. Yes, for today and for tomorrow, Jesus comes near. I have walked with a neighboring congregation, diminished by divisions and continuing misunderstanding. Though their journey has been long and disheartening, and at times it seemed we would never get near to Emmaus, Suddenly, on the road, there was a preacher, unknown to them, in their pulpit for the first time. She spoke a word of hope, a word of hope that was so compelling, so powerful, that their eyes were opened and they recognized the risen Christ in their midst. And so the next step became easier, and then there was another, and still another. And I have been walking that same path with you when the way seemed particularly difficult, when explanations were scarce, questions loomed, and darkness was all around. Suddenly, We were joined by the risen Christ who took, blessed, broke, and gave himself to us in a way that made him recognizable. Though the pain didn't immediately fall away, it almost never does. God with us, God with us, makes it possible to take another step and to find a measure of peace even in the presence of heartbreak. Our Emmaus journey, like that of Cleopas, often begins with bad news. A death, a diagnosis, a disappointment, a failure, a child off track, a parent in distress, upheaval in the workplace, addiction, a difficult decision, 
a broken relationship, political unrest, or dis-ease. We cannot go to Emmaus alone. And so we take one faltering step and wait. We search for a traveling companion. And even more, we hope something along the road will open our eyes and we will recognize the risen Christ as he takes, blessed, blesses, breaks, and gives himself to us anew. Jesus comes near. Having made the journey to Emmaus many times, it is often ours to assume the role of traveling companion. It is our privilege as people of the story to show up in places of disappointment and deep longing. It is our privilege as people of the story to show up in places of loss and frustration. It is our pri privilege and indeed our calling to show up wherever God's people are in need, in schools and in shelters, in soup kitchens and refugee camps, in battered relationships and on building sites. It is indeed our privilege and our calling to make visible the presence of the risen Christ. Jesus comes near in the flesh and blood of those who have seen and heard and told the good news that Jesus is alive and with us, that Jesus is alive and with us, always with us. As I was thinking about our text this week and meditating on it, I ran across a poem written by a Jesuit priest and artist in Canada. Christopher Mann writes this as he reflects on the journey of Cleopas to Emmaus. There was a silence, a humming, a burning, the becoming more alive of all things about us. Those arms opened their palms in shadow, embodying a promise, a blessing still alive. And then, ah, the sting of it still afflicts me. A breeze off the desert entered that moment. The lamplight flared, a door banged shut. Emmaus, as I say, we never really go there. Emmaus comes to us when least expected. It's not just the journey, not just the settings out, the routes through the desert, the arrivals. It's traveling in readiness for Emmaus that counts. It's traveling in readiness for Emmaus that counts. The poet is right, I think. Emmaus comes to us when it is least expected and we, when we are least prepared. But it's traveling in readiness for Emmaus that counts most of all. Let us make ourselves ready so that in the taking, blessing, breaking, and giving, we will recognize the risen Christ in our midst. Let us make ourselves ready so that in the taking, blessing, breaking, and giving, we may show forth the presence of the risen Christ, a presence to those who are hungry and thirsty for the good news, that we may show forth the presence of the risen Christ to those who most need to know that God is present with them. Amen.